Next up, electrolytes. All right, there are a lot of circles here, but each circle is not as deep as they have been in the past. In fact, if you look closely, you know, most of these circles have one or two or three or four slides. They don't have like 50 slides, like sometimes they do in urinary system. This one's a bit big. So a lot of the things here are review. In fact, a more difficult part may be to realize that some of the content is review, but it's interspersed with new material. So you got to remember the old stuff, but also we're going to add new stuff here and there. So, for example, a lot of the things that we cover on fluid homeostasis have been covered, but now we're adding in a couple of new things. This again, yes, this again. Again, electrolytes and pH are full of brilliance because you can make some pretty good connections. Like you can figure out some things that might have caused some mysteries for you before, like low calcium causes cramping. So that's why if you were in football, your football coach would tell you to drink pickle juice because pickle juice is acidic and that brings up calcium levels. Or maybe you've heard to eat a banana because bringing up potassium levels will also bring up calcium levels and that'll decrease cramping. Or calcium, calcium drinking milk or things like that will reduce cramping because calcium, the problem with cramping is low calcium. So there's higher level learning here and there's plenty of opportunity to hone your mastery skills by pursuing the big ideas. And I'm going to say it again that yes, this is really important for the nursing students, but everyone will derive comfort from understanding electrolytes a little bit because like I've said before in the last lecture, if you've had the flu and you're throwing up, you're going to get crampy because when you lose acid, you lose calcium and when you lose calcium, you cause muscle cramps. So one of the first things you should get back into you is either, well, pickle juice would be horrible, wouldn't it? But a banana would be great. Bring up potassium, bring up calcium, get rid of the muscle cramping that occurs after you've thrown up a lot or calcium or one of the things that I always remember is when you wake up in the, in the morning and you got one of those cramps in your neck where you can't turn your head around, that's muscle cramping. And so you can get rid of that by halfway through the day. If you take a vitamin, drink some milk, have some banana, drink some pickle juice, get your calcium back up and that muscle cramp in your neck will go away. So there's comfort in knowing your electrolytes. One of the difficulties here though, is we actually have three mini lectures. So we have fluid, then we have electrolytes, and then we have pH. And honestly, I'm gonna punt a little bit on electrolytes because that's so dense that you kind of need to separate that off and go watch separate videos. So when you look out here at sodium, potassium, and calcium, isotonic fluid down here would be pH in pure water. I'm not really gonna lecture that because you kind of need to go off and do that in a separate sitting. So I'm not gonna put it in this podcast. So again, this is a bit tricky because there's three mini lectures. We'll start with fluid. Much of electrolytes will be off in other videos and not in this video. And then probably the toughest is gonna to be pH. If you're going into nursing, pH is really, really challenging. They're called arterial blood gases when you get into that. So fluid, nice dolly. Art is creativity and creativity is the highest order of thinking as judged by Bloom's taxonomy. All right, so we're going to go into solutions and electrolytes, then fluid compartments, and then fluid in and fluid out when it comes to fluid. Then we'll come back and we'll do fluid homeostasis. And again, some of these we've already talked about. So we've talked about things like renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So again, that's one of the complexities here is parsing out, solving out, figuring out what has been covered and what's new. So this is old. It's really old. It's probably so old that you forgot it. Um, this is a review from when we covered chemistry in the second module. So a solution is when we mix things together, that's a mixture. Whatever it is in the highest concentration is the solvent. Those things in a lower concentration are solutes. So in a glass of salt water, water is the solvent. Sodium and chloride are the solutes. There's going to be several examples of solutions in the body from blood to urine to intracellular fluid to the fluid around cells it's called the interstitial fluid. So solutions are important in the body. Water is pretty important solvent in the world, but especially in biology. So males are about 60% water, while females are about 50%. Males tend to carry more energy as carbohydrate. And you know that if you have salty popcorn, you get thirsty, but if you eat a bunch of sugar, you get thirsty too, because carbohydrate needs water to be stored, at least compared to fat. Infants tend to have even more carbohydrate as energy, so they're about 73% water, while the elderly dry out a little bit. And so, as I reach my old age, I'm getting closer and closer to 45% water. In fact, that's one of the things you might notice is if you don't drink a lot of water, you get more stiff. And so water is pretty important for lubricating joints and things like that. One of the things I've noticed about getting old. When it comes to water, there's three main questions. What solutions are there? What solutes are there? And then how do I calculate how much solute is in the solution? We're not going to do that one a whole lot. 
We can break down the solutions in the body in different ways. The first way is outside of cells versus inside of cells. So outside of cells is extracellular. Inside of cells is intracellular. Recall that the chief positive ion outside of cells is sodium. We pump sodium out with the sodium testing pump. A positive ion is called a cation, while a negative ion is called an anion. The chief negative ion outside of cells is chloride. The chief cation inside of cells is potassium and the chief anion inside of cells is phosphate. We can divide up extracellular fluid into two additional compartments. So you had inside of cells and outside of cells, and we can divide outside of cells into two different compartments too. The fluid that is around cells in the tissue is called interstitial fluid. Also, the fluid that's in the blood is plasma. So most of the fluid in you right now is inside of your cells, so intracellular then interstitial, so outside but directly around cells, and then plasma. Now we turn to the question of what types of solutes are there? We're not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail, but when it comes to solutes, the solute may be charged or uncharged. Charged molecules are called electrolytes, while non-charged molecules are called non-electrolytes. The reason to distinguish these is that because of their charge, electrolytes are more powerful at causing osmosis. So if there's a concentration of solutes, both will cause osmosis. Osmosis is when water moves towards concentration, but electrolytes will make osmosis happen faster. The reason electrolytes are more powerful osmolytics is that a charged molecule will be more effective in pulling on the partial charges that are in the water molecule. So recall that a water molecule has a partial charge because in that molecule, the oxygen atom is able to pull the electrons more towards it since it has more protons in its nucleus. So the oxygen part of the molecule is more negative, so the O is more negative, and the hydrogen part is more positive, partial positive. So since electrolytes will also be attracted to these partial charges, electrolytes will pull on water more and increase the movement of water. So since osmosis is the movement of water towards concentration, increasing the movements of water increases osmosis. And again, you increase the water movement with a charged molecule because it pulls on the partial charges in the water molecule. Honestly, we don't do a whole lot with concentration because we assume you've had chemistry, or if you're not going into a program course that needs chemistry, then you won't have to have that kind of chemistry. Um, and so we assume that you'll be instructed on particular concentration calculations you'll use in your field and in your program courses. So we don't go into a lot of concentration. Do note, however, that we should understand concentration on a general level. The speed and effectiveness of hormones, drugs, poisons, other chemicals is obviously dependent on the concentration. One apple seed is not going to kill you, but if you ate a couple of apple seeds, look it up on Snopes, there might be a high enough concentration of cyanide to kill you. So in general, when you double the dose, you double the speed of the reaction, and that's going to matter in pharmaceuticals and all kinds of things in healthcare. So again, we won't get specific other than to point out that there are multiple ways to measure concentration of solutes. Moles per liter is common for chemists. When you care about charge, you use milliequivalents. Osmolarity is another. Suffice it to say, different users prefer different measurements, so you'll learn about those in your particular program courses. Since we're talking about fluid, let's next turn to how does it get in us and how does it get out of us. For intake sources, about 60% is ingested, so you ingest about 60% of your water. 30% is in your food, and we make about 10%. There's actually some mice that live in the desert and they make enough water that they never need to drink water. How do you make water? Recall that we breathe in oxygen and combine it with the hydrogen atoms from carbon molecules to make ATP. So we pull hydrogen molecules off of carbon-based molecules. We then recombine it with oxygen to make water and ATP and carbon dioxide. For water output, about 60% exits as urine, 4% as feces. We lose about 8% as sweat. The other 28% are insensible. Those are losses that we can't really sense, like evaporation through our skin or in our breath. Fluid compartments, we kind of already covered this, but let's hit it again. So I mentioned this before, but let's be specific. Fluid can be inside of cells, that's intracellular, or outside of cells. So fluid inside of cells is called intracellular. Fluid outside of cells, but directly in contact with the cells, is called interstitial fluid. The other place where fluid is, is outside of the cells, in the plasma, so in the blood. You have about three liters of plasma in you, because about half of your blood is plasma. 
I don't think you need to memorize the exact amounts of fluid, but do know the basic order. So first is fluid inside of cells, fluid outside of cells, and then plasma. Other fluid would be like CSF, the fluid around your brain, stuff like that. A little bit more fluid in and fluid out. So the reason I bring this back up is that it's hard for the body to keep track of fluid, given that there are multiple ways it comes in and goes out. So the way the body keeps track is for the kidneys to just keep an eye on it. Your body can't calculate, well, I just drank 20 ounces of water and I just lost 10 ounces of water because I went for a run. And then I had some salty popcorn, which made me thirsty. So there's too much water and too much water out for the body to keep track that way. It has to just keep track by looking at the blood often with the kidneys. Moving on, the best way to learn these water disturbances is to use the homeostasis charts that are coming up and they're also on YouTube. I wanna break it down a little bit though, just to get you started, to show that there's four main conditions when it comes to water and water and solute. You can have too much water and solute, too little water and solute, too much water or too little water. Too much isotonic water, so that's water and solute, is called hypervolemia. Too little water and solute is called hypovolemia. We have different terms for pure water because it's a different situation. Too much pure water is overhydration. Too little pure water is dehydration. Here's a sample of the causes of each of those conditions just to get your mind started on it, but do go back to the homeostasis charts. So causes of hypervolemia might be IV errors, water retention, a high salt diet, and cell damage where potassium is released. And then that potassium is gonna stimulate thirst, which together will raise isotonic fluid. So if you cause yourself to be thirsty, you're going to be thirsty. That's going to raise salt and water. So that's going to increase water and solute. Causes of hypovolemia would be blood loss or fluid loss. Causes of overhydration would be drinking too much water, which doesn't happen that often. Causes of dehydration would be sweating or diarrhea. It's a little bit difficult to think about this way, but when you lose water through sweat or diarrhea, it's not as salty as your plasma, and so you are kind of losing pure water. I know that when you sweat, it tastes salty, but it's still not as salty as your plasma. So you are losing pure water or purer water than what is in your plasma. A sample of effects. Do note how the effects are quite different going from water and solute to water. So where water and solute affects blood pressure, water alone will affect electrolyte concentration. So it'll affect action potentials, which means it's going to affect neurons, the heart, and muscles. So effects of hypervolemia are high blood pressure. Effects of hypovolemia are low blood pressure. Overhydration will dilute solutes, which will lead to problems with, again, the heart, brains, and muscles. Arrhythmias or arrest can happen. There can be CNS dysfunction, too. The brain's not going to work right. Dehydration can cause the same thing. So dehydration will concentrate solutes. Also lead to problems with the heart, brain, and muscles. And always keep in mind, too, that if you can't use your muscles, you can't use your respiratory system. So I often throw a respiratory system in with those big three of heart, neurons, and muscles. A sample of the solution. So for each of the six homeostatic diagrams, and for both too much or too little of whatever's on that chart, we want to know the name, causes, effects, and solutions. So the solutions for hypervolemia are to inhibit aldosterone, inhibit ADH, and to release something called AMP, which we'll get to. The solution for hypovolemia are to stimulate aldosterone, release ADH, thirst, and sympathetic constriction of blood vessels to get blood pressure back up. The solution for too much water is to inhibit ADH, release AMP, and have the nervous system vasodilate. The solution for too little water is ADH, angiotensin, and thirst. So again, on the six homeostatic diagrams, it's probably the best place to learn this, is find the name for too high, too little, causes for too high and too little, effects for too high and too little, and the solutions for too high and too little. That's fluid in and fluid out. So we'll now go through the specific mechanisms that control fluid. Many of these have been covered when we did the urinary system, like we did ADH, RAS, increased GFR. The other are new, but let's go through them all for the sake of covering all the major mechanisms of fluid homeostasis. So we're going to go through ADH, thirst, RAS, sympathetic, AMP, and then increased GFR. ADH, again, we'll go through this kind of fast because we cover this. 
ADH is released by the posterior pituitary in response to a concentrated plasma. ADH will go down to the collecting duct and insert aquaporins, is what we call them. And so that'll increase water absorption. So recall that ADH is released by the posterior pituitary. It's released in response to osmoreceptor sensing a concentrated plasma. ADH goes down to the collecting duct and inserts water channels. So more water is ex extracted from the filtrate. The water channels are created by aquaporins. When aquaporin is inserted into the collecting duct, the water flows out of the filtrate following the concentration gradient set up by the countercurrent multiplier. So recall how the medulla of the kidney had a high concentration of solute set up by the countercurrent exchanger. Well, if you put holes in the collecting duct, water is going to be drawn to that concentration and out of the filtrate. Also recall that alcohol inhibits ADH and leads to dehydration. Which factor would increase the secretion of ADH? Excess salt consumption would be the best answer because it's going to sense concentration. The posterior pituitary senses salt concentration. All of the following sentences about ADH are true except this is one of those where it's one keyword. So I believe ADH decreases the volume of urine, but it concentrates it because it pulls water out. So, so B is the correct answer because it should concentrate urine, not dilute it. One word. Thirst. Thirst is sensed by the hypothalamus as well as having a dry mouth, but that one's secondary. The hypothalamus senses both an increase in plasma concentration and a decrease in plasma volume, whereas the posterior pituitary only really senses plasma concentration and not plasma volume. Interestingly, thirst is quenched when fluid moistens the mouth and the stomach is stretched by the fluid that's entering it, rather than when the volume and concentration of blood actually changes. If the system waited for the water to actually change volume and concentration, we'd keep drinking, we'd keep being thirsty, we could drink a lot of water by the time the water actually gets back up to the hypothalamus and tells it that things have changed. This is kind of important because while drinking certain things will quench your thirst by wetting the mouth and stretching the stomach, it might not solve the original thirst problem and you're going to be thirsty again in 20 minutes. And this is why we're kind of motivated to drink soda sometimes, is we think it quenches our thirst, but it doesn't solve the concentration problem. And so you're going to be thirsty again in 20 minutes, so you drink more soda. That's why you got to drink water, says the guy that hardly ever drinks water. Here are the details of the mechanism. So essentially the hypothalamus will sense blood concentration. When blood pressure is low, so it's going to sense decreased blood volume and increased concentration. These two signals, along with dry mouth, will signal the hypothalamus to signal thirst. A point missing from this figure is how thirst is quenched. Again, that's from the stomach stretch and moistening of the mouth. Another interesting note, there was a medical condition from a kid around here who lost his sense of thirst. It's going to create quite a difficulty for him as he gets older. He already has lost a lot of weight in the, just the intervening year because he's not drinking enough. Um, for some mastery thinking, think of the consequences or try to come up with coping mechanisms if you were contributing to his health. I mean, think about that. I haven't really thought about that a lot, but if you've lost your sense of thirst, there's a myriad of potential problems that can arise from that. But also, if you're part of his healthcare team, you'd need to help him figure out methods to counter his lack of ability to know when he's thirsty. All right, so we'll go through this one kind of fast too, because here we return to the RAS system, which we covered when we studied the nephron. Recall that renin is released by the JG cells, but then goes through a cascade where other structures that might be affected by the high blood pressure are allowed to veto the blood pressure increase. So the liver, capillaries in the lung, and the adrenal medulla, which is the sympathetic nervous system. So recall that renin is made by JG cells when they sense decreased stretch. Or MD cells will sense, was it too low or too high, do you remember, of sodium and stimulate the JG cells further. Do you remember? It was too low of sodium in the MD cells that stimulated the JG cells. So if sodium is low at the MD cells, it means all the sodium got picked up in the PCT, which means the GFR is too low, and you need to get blood pressure up to get GFR up. So let's go through this again anyway. The specifics were that renin combines with angiotensinogen from the liver to make angiotensin 1. If the cells in the body are not healthy, they don't make everything they need. Or think about it as if the liver is too overwhelmed by fluid to do what it does, 
it won't be able to make angiotensinogen either, and then that's going to cut off the cascade. If the liver allows angiotensin 1 to be made, this floats in the blood through the lungs and encounters angiotensin-converting enzymes in the capillaries of the lungs. If capillaries of the lungs are unhappy, they'll not make ACE. If ACE is made, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, I don't have this in my figure, but it will on its own promote widespread vasoconstriction to raise blood pressure. Also, as angiotensin 2 passes through the adrenal cortex, it gets converted to aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to go to the collecting duct, and when it goes to the collecting duct, it increases the absorption of sodium. If you increase the amount of sodium, then you're going to get thirsty, and that's going to increase water absorption as well. So aldosterone will cause the collecting duct of the nephron to take in more sodium, and that'll make you thirsty, and that'll get up water levels. So the RAS ultimately vasoconstricts and increases sodium levels, which will stimulate thirst to increase blood and fluid volumes. In response to increased levels of aldosterone, the kidneys produce a urine with lower concentration of sodium. I like that because you're pulling the sodium out. Not probably potassium, higher potassium, because remember, aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump. If you pull sodium out, you pull water out, so you're going to have a lower volume. Urine with a lower specific gravity, well, specific gravity means concentration. The higher the specific gravity, the higher concentration. You're going to have a higher specific gravity because it's going to be more concentrated, and then it's not really going to affect urea actually would have more urea because it's going to be concentrated. All right, that's the RAS system. Now the sympathetic nervous system. Recall that the sympathetic nervous system can also control fluid levels by causing the afferent arterial to constrict, to reduce filtration, and cause the retention of fluid. We talked about this in terms of as you get closer and closer to your urinary test, your blood pressure might rise. And the way it's going to rise is the sympathetic nervous system is going to constrict the afferent constrict urine production, you're going to fill up with a little bit more fluid and raise your blood pressure. Also remember that the sympathetic nervous system can stimulate the direct release of renin from the JG cells. This one's a new one. It's called atrial natriuretic peptide. When looking at the RAS system, step back real fast. We'll just click on it right here. When looking at this system, one of the things you might have thought is, well, why doesn't the heart have something to do with the renin angiotensin system? Wouldn't it be nice also if the liver gets the veto, capillaries get to veto, sympathetic nervous system gets the veto? Wouldn't it be nice if the heart could veto an increase in blood pressure too? Because maybe it's not going to want to deal with an increase in blood pressure. Jumping back ahead, well, it is true that the heart does make a protein called atrial natriuretic peptide that can inhibit the renin system. So when looking at the renin system, the RAS system, doesn't seem like one of the structures that can veto the blood pressure increase would be the heart. We didn't talk about it then, but it is true that the heart can also inhibit the renin cascade. So when the right atrium is stretched, it releases atrial natriuretic peptide, and AMP will inhibit angiotensin 2, which will mean sodium will be excreted and also, it'll cut off angiotensin II's desire to constrict blood vessels. So isn't it kind of cool that the heart has a good bit of control of its workload? If it senses increased stretch, it contracts faster by the Bainbridge reflex. It contracts harder by a preload. And it'll try and get rid of some of the extra fluid by inhibiting angiotensin II with AMP. Which of the following statements about AMP are incorrect? Uh, I do think it's A, it suppresses the release of renin. It does reduce blood pressure and inhibits vasoconstriction, that's true. It is released in response to stretching. I hope that D is correct. Oh, it's definitely going to affect sodium levels because if you're affecting aldosterone, you're affecting sodium levels. And again, aldosterone is the end of the renin system. So when AMP inhibits angiotensin II, it inhibits the release of aldosterone and that inhibits the release of the reuptake of sodium. So it's definitely going to affect sodium levels, so D. Increased GFR, one last method to control fluid is one we covered very briefly when we covered blood and when we covered the urinary system. It's pretty simple. If you have more fluid in your body, like you drink an extra liter of water, more fluid goes through the kidney and so more filtrate is made. So if you drink a liter of water, you'll have an extra liter of blood going through the kidney. This extra blood will generate more urine and that's going to reduce fluid. Similarly, 
if you don't have enough fluid in you, not as much fluid will go through the kidney and not as much filtrate will be made. I was thinking about this side note. Is the principle also applies if you're stranded somewhere, dehydrated, and all you have to do is drink beer. On a side note, this is just an interesting one. The physiology is interesting. The principle applies if you're stranded somewhere, dehydrated, and the only thing you have to drink is beer. You might think, well, don't drink the beer because it's going to inhibit ADH. So if you're walking through the desert, dehydrated, and you think you shouldn't drink the beer because alcohol inhibits ADH and dehydrates you, you should drink the beer because if you have a dangerously low fluid, no fluid is going through the kidney, and so inhibiting ADH isn't going to have any effect. That's why when you drink alcohol, also you should hydrate yourself because alcohol is decreasing fluid volume and slowing the filtration that will get rid of alcohol and alcohol byproducts. So if you're really, really dehydrated, you're not going to have any fluid going through the kidneys, so drinking beer isn't, and the alcohol isn't going to affect the ADH at all. You have to have a certain amount of fluid going through your kidneys before ADH even works, and the beer would get you up to that level, so to speak. It also means that when you drink a lot of alcohol, it's going to dehydrate you. So if you drink, make sure that you hydrate at the same time. Physiological adjustments of water and electrolytes are made by... That's a dumb question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, definitely aldosterone, definitely AMP, definitely ADH. And so it's dumb because all of the above can't include none of the above. And so it should have been all of the above. That's why we argue questions in class. Sometimes DJ writes really dumb questions. The last thing to cover in fluids is edema. Edema is the accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space. So too much interstitial fluid. There's a lot of causes. We'll go through a few. Edema is so much easier to draw out. So this is a topic that's easier if we just draw it all out. So I would go look for the video on edema or on YouTube. The video is upcoming if you're on Prezi, so it'll link to it. If you're listening to this as a podcast on YouTube, then go over and find the YouTube on edema as well. So essentially the video reviews the forces we talked about when we went over capillary permeability, that there are two forces, HPC, which forces fluid out of the capillary, and OPC that draws fluid back in. Once that drawing makes sense, it becomes a lot easier to see the various causes of edema. So you can have an increase in HPC. You can have something that's damaging the capillary so it's leaky. You can decrease OPC, and then you pick up leaked fluid with the lymphatic system. If there's a blockage in the lymphatic system, that also will cause edema. So again, go watch the video, though. So I'll briefly go through a couple of examples. If HPC is too high, you'll force more fluid out of the capillaries. There's quite a few things that can raise HPC because this is essentially blood pressure. On a side note, if there's blood loss, this one's cool. I just think this one's cool. Let's go back and say things that increase blood pressure. So maybe a congestive heart failure causes an increase and then a decrease in blood pressure, but there's more fluid built up. Something that's blocking capillary, something that's blocking veins. There's all kinds of things. Uh, too much angiotensinogen, tumors that release aldosterone, things like that can increase HPC. On a side note, if you have a blood loss, and blood pressure is lost, is decreasing because maybe you're hemorrhaging, then HPC goes down and you don't push as much fluid out of your capillaries. You actually draw fluid back in from the interstitial spaces to fill your blood vessels. So it's kind of the opposite of edema if you're in a hemorrhage situation. So this HPC thing is cool. On the one hand is you want to keep it down to prevent edema, but if it gets too low, you'll actually suck fluid from the interstitial space to try and refill blood vessels. So if something damages the capillaries, that's also going to lead to edema. If there's a decrease in albumin, which would decrease OPC, so this could be liver problems not making the albumin, or maybe not enough protein nutrition because maybe you've lost too much protein through your kidneys, or poor protein in your diet would reduce albumin, and that would lead to edema. If there's a blockage of the lymphatic system, so fluid can't be drained from the lymphatic system, that would also cause edema. All of the following would cause edema, except hypotension would not cause edema because you're not forcing fluid out. Again, go and watch the video. So here's the drawing um, that we'll draw out. Even if you don't go and look at the video, maybe look around this drawing a little bit just to see some of the things that cause an increase in HPC. So heart failure can cause a buildup of fluid that raises the amount of fluid in the capillaries. Um, failure of the venous pump, so if someone's paralyzed and they can't get blood going through their veins, that's going to back up into the veins. Um, decreased plasma proteins, anything that decreases OPC. You can lose protein in a burn because you leak out fluids, or maybe you're not having enough protein nutrition, or maybe you're got, you've got pernicious anemia, things like that. 
Anyway, look around. For these are the multiple causes of edema. I would go and watch the video. Edema, again, is one of those things. It's enormously complex. It's going to affect everybody in their life, so it's something you want to understand. And it's pretty graspable if you just take the time. Everyone's going to be on bed rest sometime. Everyone's going to have fluid buildup, so everyone should probably want to understand edema. These are the videos. All right, electrolytes. I've had many students tell me this is a good book. This, more than any other time, is when you can help your future self if you're going into nursing. Sorry for the non-nursers. But again, I say it again, I'll say it again. If you understand electrolytes, it's going to lead to more comfort in your life because you can solve problems that are caused by electrolytes like muscle cramping. So when I ask former students or nursing instructors, what's the most difficult material? The great majority of people say fluid and electrolytes and also pH. These are just some whiteboards the nursing students made outside of our study area one time. I think they show that you need to have a basic grasp of electrolytes that, as we cover them. And then you'll also add more things like priorities, nursing interventions, so priorities, nursing interventions, and other assessments. So you're going to add even more to it when you go and become a nursing student. These were the boards for potassium. These were the boards for calcium. Electrolyte balance in the body usually refers to the balance of tricky question, but acids and bases technically are electrolytes because you have a proton and a hydroxyl, but acids and bases are not considered salts. Salts are electrolytes, so sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium. Most prevalent electrolyte in the extracellular fluid. If you missed that one, go back, start all over, do not pass go, do not collect $200, because you need to know the answer to this one by the time you're this far into AP2. Oh, kind of sounded mean kind of there. Most prevalent electrolyte in the extracellular fluid is sodium. Intracellular fluid is What's it again? Just kidding, it's potassium. Why do we have electrolytes and what do they do? They do a lot. They may be cofactors, like when iron sits in the middle of a hemoglobin molecule and holds the oxygen. Sodium, potassium, and sometimes calcium are used to conduct electricity. So in neurons, sodium and potassium carry the signal from one end to the other. In the heart, calcium actually participates in that conduction as well. I often call calcium the on switch because it does so much. It causes muscle contraction, causes the release of hormones causes the release of neurotransmitters. When sperm meets egg, calcium is released and it causes these waves to go across the cell. Ever think about that? You have a sperm meeting an egg and at some point you gotta start saying, hey, you start making the head things and you start making the toe things, the feet things. How do we get one cell into something that's polarized so it can become something different? Calcium waves do that. So when sperm meets egg, calcium waves go across the egg to start setting up a a polarity so you can start dividing up into different types of cells. Protons and bicarbonate play a role in acid-base balance. Sodium is sort of like the currency used by cells where after it's pumped out of the cell, it's allowed back in if it brings glucose with it or it kicks a calcium out of the cell. So electrolytes are pretty important. We defined these terms before. Cations are ions that are positively charged. They're called cations because the cathode of a battery is the positive side. Anions are negatively charged, like the anode of a battery is the negative side. I guess you don't need to know that about batteries, but that's where the term comes from. The three most important electrolytes are, of course, sodium, potassium, calcium. If you go into nursing, you're going to add things like chloride and magnesium as well. We mentioned this before as well. When it comes to homeostasis of electrolytes, we will want to know the name, cause, result, and correction for when electrolytes are too high or too low. So again, these are really dense, and you got to break them up. You can't just sit down and listen to this for a whole hour, which is why it's not in here. So the chart is here. You can also get them off of Talon, or there's a link to them on the video on YouTube. So if you go to this YouTube video and open up the More Info tab, you can also get the charts. When I make a complex video like this, I have a script. And so that script, if you're on Prezi, you can zoom in and read the script. I'm not really sure. I suppose if I did this, then you could potentially pause the video and read through this if you wanted to. It's very informal. Like it's not very grammatically beautiful. I was just creating a simple script for when I made the video, I could kind of make sure I got all the details. And man, there's a lot of details, isn't there? Four pages on sodium. But sodium is the complex one. Potassium. 
in videos. If you wanted to read this, you could pause the video and hopefully this is readable. Or I like Prezi. Like I think, I'm hoping that at some point students start going and studying on the Prezi. There's the mobile app for it too. That's one of the reasons I'm putting in the script is because with the mobile Prezi app, you can look at these slides and, and read the script on the side. So that's potassium. I don't know why that's zooming back in. Calcium. Click on the script quick in case you wanted to pause. Read through the script. Three more to go. Isotonic fluid, so that's fluid that has salt in it, and that's primarily related to blood pressure. Water that does not have salts in it is pure water. Click on the script again. One more, this one's a complex one, pH. pH gets particularly complex. You might note that it's divided up, and we're gonna go into this next, into metabolic and respiratory. So you can get acidosis due to the respiratory system, or you can get acidosis due to something other than the respiratory system, and in that case, it's called metabolic. You can also get alkalosis because of the respiratory system, or because of a problem other than the respiratory system, and that's called metabolic. So click over to the script quick. Again, you could pause if you wanted to read it. Again, I'm gonna apologize again that it's really informal. I just wanted a script that I could follow. When making the videos. I think I'm gonna skip these. Now let's go into pH. So acid base balance is next. I know I said this about electrolytes already, and I said that was the most important. But acid base might even be more important than electrolytes because it gets complex fast with respiratory and metabolic acidosis now closest, and then there's things called uncompensated, partially compensated, and compensated. I mean, I would say do your best on acid base because if electrolytes are problems, like a lot of times when people say electrolytes and nursing are tough, they're also talking about acid base, even though that's technically an acid is not an electrolyte. But do your best on acid and base because you're going to be helping out your future self. And again, even for the students not going into nursing, understanding electrolytes and acid base can help you avoid things like cramping, muscle cramping, headaches, lethargy, and other ailments. If you're feeling really tired, you could have an electrolyte imbalance. All right, first, why does pH matter? So let's start with why we should care about acid and base. Just to plant the seed, the reason is that it alters proteins. It changes potassium balance and it changes calcium balance. So those three things, we're gonna come back to that. Acid is essentially the number of protons around. H plus really is just a proton. We can call it a proton because it's a hydrogen molecule that started with a proton and an electron, but it lost the electron to get the positive charge. So now it is just really a proton. So we talk about H plus as a proton or acid as a proton. And OH is also called a hydroxyl or hydroxy ion. Acids release protons into solution and bases release hydroxy ions into solution. First, why do acids and bases affect proteins? Proteins have to be held in just the right shape. Think of an example as a protein that has to catch one molecule, then catch another molecule, and let those two molecules interact in a chemical reaction. It could be an amino acid joining with another amino acid to make a protein. It could be an enzyme breaking down something into two different parts or putting two things together. Anyway, the protein has to be in just the right shape to catch the molecules and move them together. The protein is held in the right shape by hydrogen bonds. So the pink lines on this figure show the hydrogen bonds. So on the top left one, the H is a little bit positive and the oxygen is a little bit negative. That charge interaction is the hydrogen bond that holds the protein in shape. But if a proton came along, maybe there's a free proton right at this arrowhead, well now the O is gonna to bind to that free proton and let go of this H molecule. If we did that to all of these hydrogen bonds, so we put an H here, this bond breaks and we form a bond over here, well then the pink lines go away, 
the hydrogen bonds go away and the protein basically melts, so to speak. So acid and base will unwind proteins. A lot of poisons, in fact, are very acidic or basic, so the recommendation is to drink milk. So the poison acts on the proteins in the milk rather than the proteins that make up the stomach. And having the poison act on the milk is better than throwing up the poison and letting it, the poison destroy proteins on the way back out. You can also probably think about this in terms of if you've ever had a shot of alcohol that's really strong, that's got a lot of hydroxys, OHs in it, that's what alcohol is, and that will also destroy protein bonds. So what can happen the next day or even while you're drinking alcohol is it just it will destroy some of those bonds, kill some of the cells, and it will feel like you have a sore throat the next day. So acid is going to affect proteins, but it's also going to affect potassium. If acid levels go up, protons out here will start to enter the cell by diffusion. So if you increase H, you increase the diffusion gradient and H will go into the cell. What would happen to that cell then is the cell would get depolarized. We can't have that. So since potassium is always trying to get out of cells, but is held in by a pump and by the negative charge inside the cell, when the positive protons enter the cell, potassium is going to leave. So as soon as hydrogen comes in and the inside of the cell gets a little bit more positive, a potassium says, I'd like to leave now. If there's now more potassium outside the cell, this leads to hyperkalemia, so high potassium. The same is true if this acid goes away. So if we say these acids go away, then any hydrogen inside the cell will leave by its diffusion gradient, and that would make the inside of the cell more negative. When the inside of the cell is more negative, it's going to pull potassium molecules into the cell. So potassium will have to enter the cell to balance the charge difference. Now you'll have less potassium outside of the cell, so you'll have hypokalemia. So think about potassium and hydrogen as exchanging across the cell membrane. If acid goes up, potassium will go up. If acid goes down, potassium goes down. So again, now we're up to protons and acid affect proteins and affects potassium levels. This is just an AP instructor's diagnosis, but Michael Jackson's respiratory decline due to propofol made him acidic due to the increase in carbon dioxide. So that acid caused hyperkalemia that put him into cardiac arrest. Terry Schiavo became alkalotic, and the low acid caused hypokalemia that led to her cardiac arrest. So too much and too little potassium can lead to arrest, which means acidosis and alkalosis can lead to cardiac arrest. This was her MRI. The one on the left is a normal MRI, and the one on the right is Terry Schiavo's MRI. So I got ahead of myself a little bit earlier, but acids release protons, and bases are proton acceptors. So this is a good time to hit this point again, because too much proton or too little proton are bad. So acids and bases are bad when they give out protons or take up protons. Let's review the pH scale quick. So recall that the pH scale goes from zero to 14, 7 is neutral or is water, below 7 is acidic, above 7 is basic. The pH scale is a log scale, so a jump on the scale represents 10 times as much hydrogen. So if lemon juice has a pH of 2 and coffee has a pH of 5, lemon juice has 1,000 times. So it's not 10 times 2, it's not 20, it's 10 times 10 times 10. It's a thousand times as much hydrogen. So small jumps in pH are large jumps in the number of protons. The normal pH of blood is slightly basic, and that's to get ahead of the acid that's going to be produced. So venous blood is a little bit more acidic because it's picked up carbon dioxide. Intracellular fluid is neutral with a pH of 7. Alkalosis is anytime pH is above 7.45, and acidosis is when pH is below 7.35. We're going to draw this all out in class. I also want to show it here because it shows something I didn't cover in the slides, which is that protons also affect calcium levels. So maybe, I don't know if you need to zoom in on it a little bit, but over here I wrote out that if hydrogen levels go up, hydrogen diffuses into the cell. To keep VM, voltage of the membrane, the same, potassium has to leave the cell, and that's going to cause hyperkalemia. So that's how increased acid causes increased potassium. Down here, if Terry Shiva was throwing up acid, this acid is going away. Acid inside the cell tries to follow it, and when that acid leaves, potassium has to enter the cell. When potassium has to enter the cell, we have lower potassium outside the cell, and that causes hypokalemia. Acid also affects calcium. 
Here you've got a protein called albumin. We talked about this when we talked about capillary osmotic pressures. Albumin is a big glob of a protein with negative charges, and those negative charges are balanced by calcium and hydrogen. So they're kind of competing for the albumin, kind of like oxygen and carbon dioxide compete for hemoglobin. If all of a sudden there's an increase in H, it binds to the albumin and it kicks the calcium off, so now you have more calcium in your blood. So increased protons will increase calcium in your blood. In the opposite case, in the case of Terry Shiva, when hydrogen was lost, kept throwing up the hydrogen, well that left and left these negative charges unbalanced. So calcium from the blood had to jump on albumin, which means there's less calcium in the blood now. So loss of hydrogen causes H to leave albumin. Albumin binds calcium to balance the charges, which means calcium had to leave the blood. So now you have less calcium in the blood, and that leads to hypocalcemia. So up here, review again. Why do you care about acid and base? Well, it interrupts hydrogen bonds on proteins. It affects potassium concentrations, and it affects calcium concentrations. And when you go back and you think of how often sodium, potassium, and calcium, well, potassium and calcium are into things, acid has its fingers in a lot of things, too, if it messes with potassium and calcium. So that's why pH matters. You might ask then, well, if acid is such a bad thing, why is it around in the first place? And this goes back to what we talked about in digestion. We make ATP by pulling hydrogens off carbon-based molecules. So we need to make hydrogen to get energy. Also, we need acid to help transport carbon dioxide back to the lungs as something as it binds to carbon dioxide to make carbonic acid. So then the carbon dioxide doesn't keep kicking oxygen off of hemoglobin. So we need acid for that too. So we want the hemoglobin to be able to carry the oxygen. So we can't have too much acid around. So recall that we don't want a lot of carbon dioxide hanging around because it's going to keep kicking oxygen off of hemoglobin. And we want hemoglobin to carry oxygen, so that's why you need a certain amount of acid around as well to help hemoglobin carry oxygen or let, and drop it off when it needs to. So you have this source of hydrogen because you're pulling it off carbon-based molecules. How do you control them? We have three systems, and each system balances how quick they are to react with how much acid they can handle. So for example, chemical buffers act fast, but they can only get rid of so much acid. In fact, they can't even really get rid of acid. They can only hold it and make sure that it doesn't affect proteins, potassium, and calcium. The respiratory system bolsters one of the chemical buffer systems, so it bolsters the carbonic acid system, but it takes minutes to do this. So the respiratory system allows the chemical buffer system to handle more acid, but it's a bit slower. Lastly, the kidneys can compensate for pretty large changes in acid, but it takes hours or days to bring things into balance. So as a heads up, this time that it takes for the kidney to respond leads to conditions called partially compensated, fully compensated, and uncompensated when it comes to acidosis and alkalosis. So when the respiratory system and buffer system first begin to solve an acid imbalance, the condition is called partially compensated. When the kidneys solve the problem, the condition is called compensated. But again, that takes days. Buffers. Technically, you have three buffers. The, the first one is by far the most important. So buffers act fast to get rid of acid. There are three buffer systems. Um, and again, by far the most important one is the bicarbonate buffer system. We'll touch on the other two, but since the bicarbonate system is the one that's bolstered by the respiratory system and the urinary system, this is the much more important system. What the bicarbonate buffer system does is it consists of bicarbonate, which can bind to acid and become carbonic acid. So the bicarbonate system circulates in the blood and is composed of two main molecules, carbonic acid and bicarbonate. Carbonic acid and bicarbonate. When acid levels rise, the proton combines with bicarbonate to become carbonic acid. While carbonic acid is still an acid in the sense that it can still lose that proton, the proton is no longer free to break up hydrogen bonds or alter potassium and calcium homeostasis. When acid levels fall, carbonic acid will split to keep acid levels from dropping too low. If there's a condition where there's too much hydroxyl, what happens then is it will combine with a hydrogen molecule to become water. So if you have too much OH, it'll combine with your hydrogen and make water. Then carbonic acid will split to give you another hydrogen molecule, which again then could bind to hydroxyl to give you water. So this system basically shifts right and left based on pH. If if there's a high base, high pH, we shift to the right. If there's a low base, 
or low pH, high acid, we shift to the left. The phosphate buffer system works in urine and intracellular fluid, so we don't need to focus on this much, but the inside of the cell has a good deal of phosphate. It's a major anion inside the cell. When there are too many protons, protons will bind with monohydrogen phosphate to become dihydrogen phosphate. So the reaction moves the opposite direction when proton levels decrease. It goes back and forth between these two states to sop up hydrogen ions. Also, technically, when a protein has a hydrogen bond broken by a proton, the protein has buffered that hydrogen, so it cannot go on to break other hydrogen bonds. So proteins are also buffers in this sense. The buffer system works in plasma and intracellular proteins. Here we return to the big one, the bicarbonate system. And note that carbonic acid, H2CO3, can also split into water and carbon dioxide. This also means that the respiratory system can bolster the bicarbonate system because the respiratory system can alter carbon dioxide levels. If CO2 is high, the respiratory system will increase ventilation to get rid of that extra carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide levels are low, the respiratory system will slow ventilation to retain carbon dioxide and raise acid levels. Respiratory system. One thing I like about Prezi is that it clusters information. So we just finished a cluster on chemical buffer systems. Now we enter a cluster on respiratory control of pH. This slide is here just to link the two clusters. So again, carbonic acid can split to give us protons and bicarbonate or carbon dioxide and water. The reaction shifts back and forth depending on how much acid there is. If acid's low, the reaction proceeds to the right to make more acid. Since carbon dioxide levels can go up and down, the respiratory system will increase and decrease ventilation to control carbon dioxide levels. So the respiratory system can control acid levels by controlling CO2. Heavy breathing will decrease CO2, which moves the reaction to the left to reduce protons. Shallow breathing increases CO2, which pushes the reaction to the right to increase protons. The purpose of this slide is just to reiterate the something called the law of mass action in chemistry. It's not always intuitive if you've not had a lot of chemistry. In a chemical reaction, if there's an increase in the reactants, the things on the left, the chemical reaction will proceed to the right faster and more products will be generated. Sometimes it helps to think about connected vessels of water. So if you pour water into the vessel on the left, water will flow to the right. So if there's more acid, it's like dumping water on the right, which means more CO2 will be made. So this slide also lets us reiterate that in the body, CO2 is acid and acid is CO2 because of the bicarbonate buffer system. They go up and down together. So if there's a loss in acid, the reaction will shift to the right. While not as common as increases in protons, hydroxyl items are pretty common in biology. When water splits, it makes hydroxyl ions, these guys down here. If there's an increase in hydroxyl, it'll grab a proton, make a water molecule. And then this is going to decrease the number of protons, so the bicarbonate reaction will shift to the right. So the bicarbonate system is pretty nice, and it can quickly take care of proton and hydroxyl imbalances, and it's backed up by the respiratory system. The only thing that would make it better would be if the kidneys could also back up the respiratory system and participate. Which condition would cause a drop in pH? Hypokalemia would cause a decrease in acid, so that would be an increase in pH. If hyperkalemia was here, that would be another good answer because high potassium causes high acid, which drops pH. Boy, that whole pH scale being inverted can be confusing, isn't it? Because high acid means low pH. High potassium causes high acid, causes low pH. I'm betting that you knew when I said the only thing that could make it better would be if the kidneys also played a role in the bicarbonate buffer system that you knew that I was pointing out that the kidneys do in fact back up the respiratory system. So while buffers in the respiratory system can hold on to protons or hydroxyl ions, they can't really get them out of the body. They can't get rid of them. These buffers need the kidneys to actually get the acid or base out of the body. So the kidneys do play a role. They're just slower. So while we talked about the respiratory system backing up the bicarbonate system, I was only giving you the good news. The bad news is that if there's a problem with the respiratory system, the increase or decrease in carbon dioxide will now create an acid-base problem. So the respiratory system can alleviate an acid-base problem. It can also cause an acid-base problem. So when the respiratory system cannot get rid of carbon dioxide due to ventilation issues, carbon dioxide levels will rise above 45 millimeters of mercury, and the body will be in acidosis. When the respiratory system is getting rid of too much carbon dioxide, as in a panic attack or hyperventilation, 
carbon dioxide levels will fall below 35 millimeters of mercury and the body will be in alkalosis. So even more bad news, the respiratory system is the most common cause of acid-base imbalance. So we talk about acid-base imbalance and we talk about how the respiratory system can solve it, but really most acid-base imbalances are caused by the respiratory system. So fortunately, the kidneys are a backup of the bicarbonate system. So when the respiratory system creates problems, the kidneys can solve them through a solution that will take hours or days. I mean, hours or days is kind of a bummer. Just hitting this point again with a visual. So think about things that impaired ventilation when we study the respiratory system. So things like COPD, pneumonia, flu, scar tissue. I guess COPD is also emphysema. But emphysema are a few. These will increase carbon dioxide, and this is going to increase acid. So if we increase CO2, we increase acid. Now step back and see the cluster mess that the respiratory system has created. So Michael Jackson took propofol, which slowed breathing, which increased carbon dioxide, which increased acid, which increased potassium, which slowed repolarization in the heart, which led to a long QT, which caused an ectopic pacemaker to develop, which led to cardiac arrest, which led to death. Long sequences of things that began with the respiratory system. If these connections are intriguing to you, maybe think about respiratory therapy because their profession is all about seeing how carbon dioxide can be a real cluster mess. There are not a whole lot of things that increase ventilation, but there are a few. So before we just talked about decreased ventilation, now we're talking about increased ventilation. So examples would be tumors in the brainstem that overstimulate the respiratory system, panic attack, or being in a low oxygen situation like altitude. In this case, carbon dioxide levels decrease which lowers acid, which will lower potassium, which will hyperpolarize neurons, which will interfere with the ability of the neurons to figure out what's going on. So think about the cluster mess that happens when you're in a panic attack. You're breathing too fast, which leads to a loss of carbon dioxide, which leads to decreased potassium, which leads to hyperpolarized neurons, which dumbs you down a little bit, which leads to difficulty in the neurons understanding what's going on. So you feel like you can't breathe, the lungs are slowing down breathing to get carbon dioxide back up. So the brain thinks, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I better breathe faster, which gets rid of even more carbon dioxide, which tells the respiratory centers to slow breathing down more, which leads to this, I'm trying to breathe, but I can't. And that just is a positive feedback where you keep getting rid of extra CO2, which makes your brain want to slow down breathing, but then your brain is, why am I slowing down breathing? I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And so it feeds into this panic attack. That's why one of the things you should do if you have a panic attack is rebreathe your CO2. It's the classic thing in television to breathe into a brown paper bag and rebreathe your air. What that does is it at least keeps the CO2 levels from going down because you're rebreathing back your CO2 in. So let's review how the respiratory system can be both the hero and the villain. If the respiratory system causes a problem with acid-base balance due to a loss of control of carbon dioxide, then the problem is called respiratory acidosis when pH drops below 7.35 and respiratory alkalosis when pH rises above 7.45. If acid shifts for any other reason than the fault of the respiratory system, then the conditions are now called metabolic, as in metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, that should say. Metabolic alkalosis may arise from too much alcohol or excessive loss of bicarbonates. Other causes might be ketoacidosis and diabetes, kidney failure, accumulation of lactic acid with physical exertion, or things like starvation. Causes of metabolic alkalosis, so the absence of acidosis, alkalosis would include anything where acid is lost, as in vomiting the contents of the stomach, we call Terry Schiavo. Introducing too much bicarbonate to the system can cause alkalosis, whether from consuming too much in a diet by perhaps taking too many antacids, or by absorbing too much bicarbonate from our food. Because you're making a lot of acid when making ATP, you need a constant source of bicarbonate to balance that acid. So you gotta constantly have this balance. The kidneys can make bicarbonate, but most bicarb is absorbed by the digestive system. Unfortunately, the digestive system absorbs bicarbonate kind of like those transporters did in the PCT. They just work at one speed and they're highly dependent on how fast things pass by. In the GI, how fast things pass by, the extremes are diarrhea and constipation. So if food passes through the GI too slow, as in constipation, too much bicarbonate can be picked up, and that's going to cause alkalosis. If food passes through too quickly, as in diarrhea, then not enough bicarb can be picked up, and that'll lead to acidosis. It's amazing how something as simple as how fast food goes through your GI 
can affect acidosis and alkalosis, and then let that run a little bit. Those would be extreme cases, but again, if you had diarrhea and you concentrated solute, you're increasing the potassium, can lead to cardiac arrest. You're also at the same time not able to pick up acid. In fact, this is kind of balancing out. The diarrhea would get rid of solutes and concentrate things, but also it does make you a little bit more at least acidosis, so it gets your potassium levels back up. So think about what a cluster mess this can be, because in the case of diarrhea, you're getting rid of extra fluid, and that's going to concentrate potassium. That's going to be a problem. At the same time, you can't pick up base, so that's going to make you acidic. If you got high acid, that's also going to drive up potassium. So think of the cluster mess of things like that. What's happening in the GI, something as simple as absorbing food from your GI tract can have widespread effects on many other systems. What a cluster mess. So there's a few different ways to figure out if a patient's acidosis or alkalosis is metabolic or respiratory. There's something called the Rome system, which basically is a mnemonic for respiratory is the opposite, metabolic is equal, or the which one is different system. I'll leave it to you and your program courses to figure out which method works for you. At this point, I have at least got kind of an understanding where it's just intuitive to me, but you can also just Google arterial blood gases to get more information. I just want to get you started on this process by having you realize that if the respiratory system is doing the wrong thing given the amount of acid and carbon dioxide, then the respiratory system is at fault and it's respiratory acidosis. If the respiratory system is doing the right thing, then it's trying to be the hero and the fault is somewhere else. This would be metabolic acidosis. So I've drawn a simple figure to help divide that up. So on the left, if pH is below 7.35, we know it's acidosis. High acid should mean high CO2 if you have high CO2, we would expect we would expect rapid breathing to get rid of the CO2. If the respiratory system is not breathing rapidly, then the respiratory system is the problem, and this is respiratory acidosis. If the respiratory system is breathing fast, it's trying to be the hero. It's trying to solve the problem caused by something else, and so this is metabolic acidosis. Does that make sense? If the respiratory system is doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's metabolic. If the respiratory system is doing the opposite of what it's doing, it's respiratory. The same thing applies to alkalosis. So in alkalosis, pH is above 7.45. Low acid means low carbon dioxide. In low carbon dioxide, we expect the respiratory system to slow down breathing to retain carbon dioxide and get the acid back up. If the respiratory system is not breathing slow, so not breathing slow, then the respiratory system is the problem, and this is respiratory alkalosis. If the respiratory system is breathing slow, well then the respiratory system is being the hero, it's trying to solve the problem, and so this is metabolic alkalosis. So if respiratory system is right, it's metabolic. If respiratory system is wrong, and again, it's intuitive to know high CO2 means high breathing, low CO2 means low breathing. That's kind of intuitive. If the respiratory system is doing the right thing, it's not respiratory, it's metabolic. Acidosis, yeah, I like A. Uh, it's not only caused by abnormal respiratory conditions because you have metabolic. It's when blood pH is below 7.35, so I don't like C. It's always corrected by the chemical buffer system, not always because it could be respiratory and urinary, is compensated for by intestinal secretion of acid. That's not true. That happens in the kidney, not necessarily in the intestine. So I like A. Kidneys. Let's get more specific about this. I mean, it's pretty simple, but if pH is low, then there's too much acid. So the kidneys can excrete acid, and they can also make bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule. And also it makes sure that it absorbs all the bicarbonate that it can from the proximal convoluted tubule to get bicarbonate up. So if you've got too much acid, you want to get your base levels up. In high pH, what you can do is excrete bicarbonate to get rid of that extra base. Here are the details for bicarbonate production and acid excretion. I don't think you need to go into these details all that much. Just keep in the detail that if you are high in acid, you need more bicarbonate, so you absorb more or you make more. If you've got too much base, you just get rid of extra bicarbonate. Some questions finally then. I guess I did that one already. That one was A. The only organ in the body that can remove excess fixed acids. The only one that can get it out of the body. Lungs can hold it. Buffers can hold it. The only thing that can get it out, though, is kidney. C. 
patient with alkalosis would experience alkalosis would be low acid low co2 should be breathing slow low co2 breathing slow so c this is also the kind of question where as soon as you start reading through it you realize that c and e are opposites so it's got to be one of those two and it's hypoventilation this is a typical question that'll be on the test. I would recommend that when you start reading this, as soon as you see acidosis, you just stop right there and predict what the person should be doing. So as soon as I stop at acidosis, high acid, high CO2, I want them to be breathing fast. They are breathing fast. Respiratory system is doing the right thing. It's definitely acidosis because it's telling you it's acidosis and the respiratory system is doing the right thing. So it's not respiratory. This is metabolic. Person with acidosis, again, I expect them to be high CO2, breathing fast. They're not breathing fast. Respiratory system is not doing the right thing. So this is respiratory acidosis. This is B. Person with alkalosis, stop right there. Low acid, low CO2, should be breathing slow. They are breathing slow. That means the respiratory system is being the hero, not the villain. So this is metabolic alkalosis. Alkalosis, obviously, because it says it's alkalosis. Person with alkalosis is breathing rapidly. Alkalosis, low CO2, low breathing, should be breathing slow. They're not breathing slow. Respiratory system is the villain. So this is respiratory alkalosis, that's D. This is a nomogram. A nomogram is a graph that scales three things. I mean, think about that. You've graphed so many things on an X and Y scale. Now this has a third axis. So to graph acidosis and alkalosis, you have to graph pH by carbonate levels and carbon dioxide levels. So I won't go into detail. I just wanted to put it here because I think it's cool and maybe some of you might want to look at it a little bit. So notice that pH is down here, bicarbonate is here, and then the lines going through represent CO2. One thing you might note is that acute respiratory acidosis or acute respiratory alkalosis swings our pH out a long ways. And then over time, chronic, which means over a couple of days, it's gonna swing in. Do you know why that's gonna swing in? Why does this swing into here? Why does this swing into here? It swings into here because the kidneys can start to solve a respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis problem. Sometimes the kidneys are the cause of a metabolic, so it doesn't always work for metabolic as well. You could, if you wanted to, if you wanted to work on your mastery skills and work on your visual graphing skills, you could literally think your way through all of these because chronic respiratory acidosis is going to be obviously a low pH, lower than 7.35. And since it's a chronic respiratory acidosis, we expect CO2 levels to be high. And if it's chronic, we expect the body to come back and make bicarbonate to try and balance it out. So the clear difference between chronic respiratory acidosis and acute respiratory acidosis is more bicarbonate. So the kidneys are making that bicarbonate to correct the acidosis. That's why this shifts up. So it's kind of fun to go through. Okay, fun is a relative term, but it's fun to go through this and think about, yeah, metabolic alkalosis is a high pH. The problem started with too much bicarbonate. And one of the ways the body's trying to solve it is get rid of CO2 to bring us down. And one of the things the body's trying to do, at least from down here, acute respiratory, is trying to get our CO2 levels up to balance out. If you've got alkalosis, hold on to CO2 to get rid of the problem. Just a quick figure to show how acid base is more of a problem in the young and infants. So first of all, they have less lung, so they can't deal with things with CO2 as well. They can't balance things with the respiratory system as much. They have a higher rate of fluid in and fluid out. They have a higher metabolic rate, which means they're making more acid. They have a higher rate of water loss, which concentrates solutes. And the kidneys are not as efficient. So acid base is a bigger deal in infants because of these reasons. If you want to start thinking about ABGs, arterial blood gases, then this drawing will introduce uncompensated, partially compensated, and fully compensated. Again, you're tracking three things. If you're going into nursing, I might at least start the process of understanding this because it gets kind of difficult because you got to track three things, acid base, CO2 levels, and bicarbonate. But I'm not going to bug everyone with this if you're not going into nursing. If you've got the extra energy now, it's probably going to be something you're going to pat yourself on the back for when you get to those first couple of weeks of foundations of nursing. Just another view too. We're going to draw out a lot of this. And then some of my notes, maybe this will help you understand partially compensated a little bit more too. 
mastery level, so stick with me. Don't just skip out right here because we have a few more slides that I want to go through. But you can explore anion gap. That's something that's additional extra. It comes into chloride or more pathologies associated with fluid volume. All right, so let's go through this one. Jennifer Strange, maybe Google this so you can hear the actual tapes. I couldn't put couldn't put the audio on Prezi easily, even though it was in my PowerPoint. So it's weird to hear this nurse call in. It's weird to hear her voice. Jennifer Strange was in a water drinking contest to drink 20 ounces of water every 10 minutes until a person relented and urinated. The winner, this was back when the first Nintendo Wii was really hard to get. And so the competition was to win the original Nintendo Wii. While there was danger to the bladder and kidneys, the real problem was the dilution of electrolytes. So I always think about this in examples of people need to understand evolution. Radio disc jockeys don't understand evolution in the sense that we assume our body can solve problems that it's never really faced. And our body has never really faced a problem of drinking too much water because we drink water, we wet our lips, our stomach stretches, and we stop drinking water. There's not a situation where evolution has had to solve this person is drinking too much water. It's similar to the immune system. Your immune system is really good at barriers and in epithelia, but it's not in other places. Like if you get an infection in the pericardial sac, you're not expecting an infection there. And so your immune system is not really defending there. Evolution has solved major problems, but it hasn't solved problems that don't exist, like drinking too much water. So you don't have an evolutionary drive to throw up. You don't have these evolutionary drives. So if you're not... So the reason this one is here is because the radio DJ goes on and on about how if you drink too much water, you're just going to throw up. And he's completely oblivious to the fact that that doesn't happen. Maybe he has heard that you can't drink a gallon of milk, but that's related to the fat in the milk. That the pyloric sphincter in the stomach doesn't like to pass fat very fast. And so milk will sit in your stomach until your stomach gets tired of it and you throw it up. But that's not true of water. Water will pass right through the pyloric sphincter and it'll pass into the small intestine. And you can't get rid of water in any other way than to absorb it into your blood. And once it's in your blood, it's diluting electrolytes. I will be a you gamer now. It. Has anybody showed You're up gaming. yet for the con contest? I'm not sure. We told them to be here by 6 a.m. Right. And then at 6 a.m., we're going to rally them all together. Starting at 6.15, they're going to start their drinking their water. Yes, the water's mm. here. Fester's yes. here. He's going to drink with them. Oh, good. Fester, you, did you drink? And there's Fester at the yeah. uh, webcam. How much water do you think you can you can drink before you have to wee? <laughs> We're gonna I be drinking I, like. What I do, I, I did like two gallons. Two, two gallons? gallons? Oh, That's dude! Can't you get water poisoning and like die? Water water. Your, your body is ninety eight percent water. Why can't you take in as much water as you want? How much I don't know. Because that poor kid in college. I know. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, well, he was doing other things. Maybe so. we should have researched this. I don't before. know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we never do this before I start doing something. Well, you know, I break it, out in hives, I'm in an ambulance. If it gets dangerous for somebody, their body will automatically throw it up. And if you throw up the water, you're out of the contest. So again, evolution has seen the problem of dehydration over and over and over. It has several solutions. It's got thirst, dilate the efferent to prevent water loss, JG cells, MD cells, increase renin, the posterior pituitary root knows to release ADH when plasma is too concentrated. Evolution has not seen the problem of drinking too much water. The signal to stop drinking again has been sufficient in almost all cases except for a radio DJ contest. Or there have been fraternity hazing contests. Or once in a while people will go to the Grand Canyon and they'll hear the warning to drink water and they'll drink too much water. But other than that, there's not been a whole big problem with people drinking too much water. There's no appetite that says, I had too much water, I better eat some salt now. The hypothalamus doesn't say, well, I drank too much water, I better urinate more. You don't have an evolutionary homeostatic mechanism to get rid of extra water because you have a mechanism to make sure you never had too much water, which is your mouth gets moist and your stomach stretches. Your body does not have any of these. It doesn't have any of these methods to cope with drinking too much water. And any mechanism that it does have to get rid of extra water are really slow. So it's really just going to be, if you drink more water, you make more blood, more blood goes through the kidney, more blood through the kidney means more filtrate and you get rid of fluid. But that's slow, definitely too slow in this case. One of the saddest things is someone who teaches nurses to be is that a nurse called into the show and warned the host that drinking too much water could cause death. Her name was Eva, so listen to the video sometime. Eva? Eva? Yes? What do you want to say? I want to say that um, 
that those people that are drinking all that water can get sick and possibly die from water intoxication. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're yeah, they, sign, they sign releases, so we're not responsible. It's okay. And, and if they get to the point where they have to throw up, then they're going to throw up and they're out of the contest before they die. So that's good, right? Oh, that's mean. I suppose so. Yeah. All right. Do you got, how come you guys Thanks didn't do it? Thanks for looking out, though. We don't want to die. Oh, okay. Let me ask Carter yeah, if anybody's dying. We ain't dying. Hey, Carter, is anybody is anybody dying in there? Uh, we got a guy that's just about to die. <laughs> oh, good. Make sure you sign that I like that, that we laugh at that. Yeah. Make sure Bring he signs the stretcher. release. Get the insurance on that, please. When asked, why are you not doing this? She replied, because we don't want to die. A nurse needs to be confident enough to speak truth to power, speak truth to save someone's life. I mean, that's the primary reason, but also for your own financial reasons. If a patient sues somebody, they're going to sue everyone, the CEO of the hospital, the MD, the nurse, anyone else that's in that room, you're all going to have malpractice insurance. So have the confidence in yourself to speak up. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think Eva actually could have been more confident, more outspoken, more strong, and actually got the attention of these hosts to get them to stop. And that would have saved this woman's life. Mother of three kids. All of these are true. If you can listen to the audio, you'll hear Ms. Strange reciting her symptoms. Hello. Jennifer, I heard that it's not you're not doing too well. My head hurts. Aww. They keep telling me that it's the the water that it's my it'll tell my head to hurt and then it'll make me puke. But I who, who told you that the intern? Yeah. Just one of over there. Like, it kind of it makes you it hurts, but it makes you feel lightheaded. So I'm not sure if I'm just like. This is what it feels like when you're drowning. There's a lot of water inside of you. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> She's lightheaded and her head hurts and they keep telling her that she'll throw up, which is not true. There was too much fluid in her brain and her neurons were not functioning correctly due to the ions being diluted. It's hard to know what specifically led to death, but it could have been a number of things. The neurons that caused breathing could have slowed down. What happened is she won second place. She was supposed to win tickets to a Justin Bieber contest. When they came to pick her up to take her to the contest, they found her dead. Could have caused hyperpolarization of neurons in the brain so the heart stops. Burst blood vessel in the brain could have been a number of things. For some mastery thinking, you know, try to think of other things that could have led to her death. And also think about what would have been different if they used Gatorade rather than water. So this takes us back to the difference between pure water and isotonic water. I don't know that it would have changed anything in the sense that she still would have had a huge fluid volume. She would have had edema. It would have caused swelling in the brain, but it might not have caused the electrolyte imbalances. And if those are what caused her death, maybe the heart stopped. Maybe she stopped breathing. Maybe the brain just ceased functioning because it was so diluted. Any of those things that could have caused death would have been eliminated by Gatorade at least. All right, so that's Jennifer Strange. Uh, explore the various causes, treatments of edema. Boy, I put some of the things on that drawing, but there's multiple, multiple causes. I mean, maybe go read edema on Wikipedia and try and understand all the different causes. With these diagrams, I mean, I have a lot on these diagrams, but there's more. Or you could always add chloride and magnesium if you wanted to do more mastery thinking. I think this one's really interesting. We talked about this one today because we did respiratory system in class today as I'm reviewing this. But it's interesting how in the last few years, pain has been described as the fifth vital sign. And so they've often treated pain because what happens with pain is it causes hyperventilation. Hyperventilation constricts blood vessels. When you constrict blood vessels, you don't get as much blood to the brain. And when you don't get as much blood to the brain, it acts weird. It causes anxiety. And so pain can not only be something someone has to tolerate, but it also can affect blood flow, which affects behavior. And so, so for the last 10 years, maybe 10 years, I'm not in the medical field really, um, obviously, but they've talked about pain as the fifth vital sign and they try to treat it pretty aggressively. But now you're seeing places like in West Virginia where drug companies have given West Virginia, the state of West, West Virginia, enough pain pills that everyone in the state had 730 odd pills. So then you have this problem where too much treating of pain can be a problem too. It's just an interesting thing to explore. How pain can affect breathing, can affect acidosis, alkalosis, and that can cause a huge cluster mess. But since we haven't come up with a pain mechanism that's not necessarily addictive as well, and maybe, boy, that's another thought to just have. Maybe humans just like the altered reality of not having pain, and so there is no such thing as a pain pill that's not addictive. It's just an interesting thing to explore. You could explore the anion gap. That one's kind of complex. And then really, if you're going into nursing, look at arterial blood gases. All right, that's it. Thank you.